we're going to delve into more depth in synthesis and signal processing. Uh, how do the uh, audio effects that we looked at in module two actually work? Uh, and how do the, uh, the virtual instruments that we uh, were using in module three actually work? How does all this stuff come together to actually make sound and transform sound? Uh, I want to talk about the basics of synthesis and signal processing, uh, what they are, what the difference between them is, uh, and some of the reasons we might want to implement our own uh, synthesis or signal processing systems, uh, and some of the challenges we might encounter in doing so. Uh, so synthesis is essentially uh, generating audio from scratch. Uh, so uh, not going out with a microphone and recording it and then editing it or, or, or doing something with it, but generating it from scratch uh, uh, by either analog or digital means. Uh, so you can uh, imagine we have this uh, uh, waveform here, uh, like the ones we've been looking at through the, the whole course. And you can imagine that we're generating uh, this entire waveform uh, uh, from scratch uh, uh, on the computer. Uh, so how would we actually do that? Uh, it's, uh, it actually goes back to, to what we were talking about in the very first lecture in the, the course, this notion of a, a waveform as a function, like y equals sine x or, or something like that. Uh, you can imagine that we can synthesize a sine wave, uh, since no perfect sine wave is, is ever going to exist that we can capture on a microphone. Uh, we'd have to synthesize this from scratch. Uh, and so uh, uh, we can simply uh, use this function, sine x, uh, to figure out what the amplitude value should be uh, at every uh, sample over time. Uh, so this is a fairly straightforward example of, of synthesis, of making a sine wave. Uh, it turns out there's a lot of different techniques uh, that we can use to synthesize sound. Uh, beyond just assigning a simple function uh, like this that can give us more flexibility and power to shape what that uh, sound is actually going to be like, what its timbre is going to be. We're going to look at four types of synthesis. Uh, there are many more, but these are four uh, uh, very important ones. Uh, additive synthesis, uh, creating uh, sounds by adding together a bunch of uh, sine waves or other basic waveforms. Uh, subtractive synthesis, which is kind of the opposite, starting off with a very rich sound source, uh, like a white noise, for instance, and then filtering it and kind of sculpting it. Uh, modulation synthesis, which is using an oscillator like a sine oscillator or something like that to actually uh, uh, create an envelope that controls some other parameter of our sound. Uh, and granular synthesis, which is about looking at uh, a sound not uh, so much in, in terms of waveforms, but as uh, these tiny grains, these tiny little bits, a few milliseconds each, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and creating uh, tens or thousands of these every second uh, to create this notion of a, a kind of cloud of sound or texture. Um, so uh, that's what synthesis is in some, some basic types of synthesis. Uh, so what is the difference between synthesis and signal processing then? Uh, uh, signal processing is about uh, transforming existing audio, the same way we've done when we've added audio effects to tracks and Reaper, uh, the same way that uh, effects pedals work when we plug a guitar into an effects pedal. Um, we get in some kind of uh, uh, a source audio, uh, and we do something to it and send the transformed version out. Uh, when we do this in the, the digital domain, we tend to call it DSP, that's uh, digital signal processing. Uh, and a lot of the same techniques that we looked at uh, on the last slide here, uh, additive, subtractive, modulation, and granular, um, these mostly can be applied to signal processing as well. Um, so they can create sounds from scratch, but we can also adapt these, uh, these techniques uh, to process existing sounds. So, why would we actually want to uh, synthesize, in particular, our, our, our own sounds from scratch? Uh, uh, why not just use kind of what's out there already? Or, or, or why not just uh, you know, get musicians that play uh, violins and pianos and guitars and all that to just come into the recording studio and, and, and record them with a microphone? Um, there's a bunch of different reasons we might want to do this. Uh, I want to highlight, too, and give you some historical examples of, of why this has been important to, to composers uh, over the years. Um, the, the, the first reason is, is a question of, of control and, and, and precision, really, uh, goes along with this. This notion that uh, human beings can't play perfectly quantized rhythms like the ones uh, that we, uh, we created when we, when we edited MIDI data in Module 3. Um, or uh, a composer might want to create incredibly complex uh, rhythms like the... Uh, uh, the, the tempo relationships that Konlo Nankaro uh, did with his uh, player piano rules and his player piano studies. Uh, these are things that are incredibly difficult or perhaps impossible for uh, uh, human musicians to actually realize with uh, complete precision. Uh, computers, on the other hand, are very good at doing exactly what they're told and, and realizing things very precisely. Um, and so uh, if, we, uh, if we work with synthesized sounds that we can control 
um, via MIDI sequencer or via uh, uh, computer algorithms that, that we might write ourselves, uh, it gives us a, a degree of control over every aspect of the music that, that we might not have if we uh, were simply a, a writing a musical score and then handing that off to other musicians to perform on, on conventional instruments. Uh, one uh, example of this that I, I really like is a, a piece by uh, Milton Babbitt called Ensembles for Six Synthesizer from, from the mid-60s. Uh, and this was a piece written uh, at the Columbia Princeton uh, Electronic Music Center. Uh, this was one of the first uh, centers for uh, the study of electronic music uh, based at a university in the United States. And uh, uh, when, it was, uh, when it was founded, they uh, purchased this uh, this uh, incredible synthesizer uh, called the, uh, the RCA Mark II. Uh, uh, and this was one of those things that took up an entire room. It was not a digital synthesizer, it was an analog synthesizer. Uh, but you could control it with this, uh, this uh, kind of paper tape that went through it that controlled all these different parameters about the, the sound that you were making very precisely. Uh, not just the rhythms and the pitches, but also very precise aspects of the timbres and how those timbres were created. Uh, and Milton Babbitt, uh, perhaps more than anyone else, really fell in love with this uh, the synthesizer because he, he was using the, the, these complex approaches to, to organize and structure every aspect of his music. Uh, and uh, uh, he often wrote for, for, for human musicians on, on conventional instruments, but um, he found that the RCA uh, uh, let him achieve this level of precision uh, and kind of realize these structures in ways that, that, that might not be possible if he was, uh, if he was working with uh, traditional instruments. Uh, so Ensembles for Synthesizer is a, is a great example of the work he did uh, with the RCA Mark II. The uh, other reason uh, that I want to point out that people might want to uh, uh, synthesize their own sounds from scratch is that they want to create uh, completely new uh, timbres, uh, new sounds that don't exist in the physical world in any way. Uh, and a classical example of, of that is a composer uh, whose uh, his name is uh, Edgar Varese, who's considered by many to be a, a kind of the, one of the, the founders of, of electronic music. Uh, even though he, he didn't have access to uh, uh, technologies uh, to make electronic music for most of his life, uh, it was only at the very end that he was able to create some works with electronics. Uh, but throughout his entire career as a composer, he was exploring ways to make new sounds in performance and to think about sounds differently. Uh, and, and this piece uh, uh, that he finished in 1931 called Ionization is a great example of that. It's a, it's a piece that's only for percussion. Um, so there, there are no real traditional instruments in, in the ensemble that he composed for. Uh, and uh, even within these, these percussionists that he, he wrote this music for, um, there's some traditional percussion instruments like uh, snare drums and, and things like that, but there's also some instruments that, that you might not have thought of as instruments, like a, a siren, for instance. And what he was really trying to do was to, to create new kinds of timbres and sounds that you, uh, uh, you didn't normally think of hearing in a concert hall uh, you know, when, say, an orchestra played. To really expand the palette of, of timbres that we thought of as being musical, uh, and to particularly think about how to organize those timbres musically. Um, uh, his, his notion of organized sound is still uh, uh, an idea that's important in, in electronic music composition today. Um, so I think ionization is, is this great early example, this kind of pre-electronic example, of this, this search for new sounds uh, that ultimately led uh, uh, musicians to, to turn to synthesizing sounds in order to create these radically new things. Now, I, I want to uh, follow up that, that idea about the search for new sounds and timbres uh, with a caution. Uh, and this comes from uh, uh, one of the pioneers of computer music uh, who developed some of the very first uh, languages for computer music. Uh, and uh, I, I think this quote really sums it up beautifully, uh, Max Matthews. Uh, it is very hard to create new timbres we hear as interesting and powerful and beautiful. Uh, what he's really trying to say here is that you know, uh, anyone can sit down and, and, and create a synthesis algorithm and, you know, and, and create a synthesizer. Um, but the overwhelming majority of these new sounds that you create with the synthesizer uh, are gonna sound horrible. Uh, they're not gonna sound musical and, and no one's really gonna wanna use them. Um, what's the real challenge here is, 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 is not making something new, but making something that's, that's worth making that's new. Um, and that's, that's really where the challenge of synthesis and sound design uh, uh, comes in. They, they may feel very uh, uh, simple and limited as we look at them, but um, as we see how they can be extended uh, in different ways, we'll see how they, they, they can really become a, a, a rich ways of synthesizing sound that, uh, that, that have the potential to, to, to meet this challenge. Uh, so what we've looked at in this unit is, uh, is uh, uh, what synthesis is and what signal processing is and, uh, uh, and some of the, the, the issues and, and, and motivations uh, behind using them. 
uh, I want to look at a very fundamental idea uh, that's, that's required to do that, uh, and that's the notion of a unit generator. 